Hi, this is the second of the introductory lectures on the Android programming course. In this talk, we're going to have a look at the project uh, that's on the module and how it's structured, how it will be assessed, and also how you can best contribute to the, the project. So in terms of, of thinking about the project and the selection of it, this is something you're going to want to think about because you'll have a bit of degree and a bit of choice and freedom in this. In terms of, of sort of framing this, um, as mentioned in the first introductory talk, it is by far the most important bit of the module. The whole module is set up and structured around the project and the mark that you get in the module will depend solely upon your contribution to the project. 100% uh, of the, the credit on it is associated with it. So it is something you'll want to, to fully engage with. You'll have a, a good degree of choice in, in terms of the type of project that you create and the features of that project. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, just to highlight that there is a number of hand in points along the way. So the project spans over both semesters. It's nearly 24 weeks in duration. Different hand in points are really feedback opportunities, the final submission at the end, which will then get to be formally assessed. So it is really important. In terms of advice on selecting the project, so I've got one slide here that tries to, to bring together, if you like, the really important advice. Stick to this stuff and, and you'll have a project that is sort of roughly of the right size. Um, first, most, first and most important bit is to pick something and I'll talk about the, the, the choice you have, so you'll have a degree of control over the features that you put in. But do something, develop something that you want to do, that you're going to enjoy, that you think that would be fun to do that. And as a reminder, the reason we do this is that if we want to encourage learning, we need to do something that we find useful or fun. Um, and if we don't have those mechanisms, it's hard for us then to put the time and effort in, the practice necessary to bring about learning. So whatever game you're developing, make sure it's something that interests you. Make sure you're picking things where, you know, you like the sound of them, where that sounds an interesting, fun thing to do. And you will have the freedom to do that. Second aspect of this is that for the game you're developing, keep it simple. Almost to the point where you think it's too simple. Um, it's, it's easy to get carried away with grand, complex games. That's fantastic. Though the reality here is that you have a finite amount of time, it's not that much. There'll be other modules alongside this module, there'll be a good learning curve associated with the module getting up to speed. So it's better to go for a simple idea than a, a big grand idea. Pick something you think, yeah, I can comfortably do that within the time that's available. And the third piece of advice is instead of picking a game where you think, well, I'll have three different characters and nine different levels and all of these different features, no, that, that's fine to think about it. Aim to write something that is more akin to a demo than a fully completed game. So overall for the project, I would suggest going for a fun, simple demo. If that's what you aim to produce, rather than a complete, fully featured complex game, you're pitching a better, fun, simple demo. In terms of a bit more advice on this here, I say here, include contingency planning. Now, the reality is that in terms of the plans that people set out and the amount of time that, generally speaking, developers set aside to do something, but we've a tendency to assume, well, okay, I'll probably take about a week to implement this, but we never get to see all of the other things that ongo in that time, the unforeseen difficulties that come up. So things are never really as smooth as we would want them to be. So for all of the features that you're doing, and, I'll, and we'll be breaking things up into sprints that are three, four weeks in duration. Again, you're probably aiming at, at planning for those sprints, the types of things you think, well, I think it'll probably take about two weeks to do this. And if you pitch it at that level, in reality, it'll probably take you three weeks because there'll be some unexpected things. So do build in contingency planning. And again, that ties into the idea, the notion of doing something more simple rather than more complex. Most certainly have a look at the assessment criteria, and there's a document I'll talk about later on. The criteria tell you how the project's assessed. It tells you the different categories. It tells you what you need to do to get a first or a 2-1 in each category. So look at that, because 
what you're doing will ultimately be assessed against those criteria. Um, so you, you definitely do want to review it and, and at least have that as one of the things in your mind that helps shape the types of features that you create. Um, beyond this, it's a team-based project. You will be working in a team. Um, that gives you, now there's, there's benefits for working in a team and, and roughly we're speaking of sort of teams of five or so students. There'll be an opportunity the first couple of weeks to get yourself into teams. I will act as a brokering service as need be if, if people want me to, to help t uh, form teams. Now, working in a team has positive aspects, also has negative aspects. In terms of the positive aspects, it enables you then to tackle something that's larger. You're, you're bringing people together, you're pulling resource. So developing a, you know, a decent sized gaming app for one person over the module, that's a real challenging setup. If you've got a team of five, it's much more manageable. Um, you'll be able then to draw upon individual strengths where people may have some strengths in some areas and can complement by strengths in other areas from other people. So these are the positives that will help the project that you create. In terms of the challenges, working in a team is not a free activity. Time and effort has to be invested in terms of keeping the team together, in terms of communicating what each member is doing, in terms of making sure people are working in a way that's you know, aligned with one another, bringing their code together, integrating their code, not all people going off doing their own uh, separate thing. So you're going to have to set aside time and effort to plan that coordination, uh, that, that sort of activities within it. And I suppose in all of these things, showing a bit of willingness and flexibility will, will, will help because team members will have different experiences as they go through. Just to highlight though, that the mark you get at the end, even though you're working in a team and there will be this single artifact that is created, will be untangling individual contribution to that article in terms of working out what each person did. So there, for each of the class files that are created, there'll be a, a and you'll see this in the assessment document, a section where you indicate, well, who coded this and who coded that and who was responsible for this bit and who was responsible for that bit. And it's when we're assessing this, uh, say a team of five people, each person will get an individual mark based on their contribution to the project. A um, few other related aspects. So we know it's an Android game that we're creating. On this module, unlike first year modules, so in the first year modules you would have been used to uh, having a series of lectures and a series of labs every single week. And within the labs you would go in and there'd be a set of guided instructions that would take you through how you do this or how you do that. This module does not have practicals, it has advisory sessions you can drop into. Um, some of the level 2 modules do have practicals, some of them don't, this one doesn't have. Now, that's significant and this will be one of the challenges for this module that you will encounter. And every single year, a number of students say at the end, it would be really nice if there was a series of practical activities put on in the course that took me through how to create an Android game. So practical one, looking at how you get the environment set up, practical two, a bit about infrastructure, practical three, maybe graphics or something like that. I don't do that. That means that it is your responsibility to do these things yourselves. I will be giving you information on it, I'll be giving you instructions on it, um, but it's up to your own time and effort and your problem solving ability to try to do these things. So I'm expecting you to do it. Now, the advisories and the drop in sessions, if you get stuck, you can come along and get actually help and support on it. Now, why am I doing this? Why do I not have a series of practicals? Because it is a purposeful decision to exclude them. A couple of good reasons. The first, the most important reason, is that whenever you go into your placement year, you're going to find yourselves in an environment where you are expected to pick up new languages, new technologies, and new frameworks yourself. There isn't, or it's unlikely to be people there who's going to hold your hand or put on training courses or take you through step by step by step. So actual developers, software engineers, one of the key skills they have is the ability to, to learn new techniques, new languages, new frameworks, new APIs themselves. 
And given the pace of change within computing, that things change so quickly, that's a really essential skill to develop. And the easiest way to develop that is to simply push people in at the deep end and say, well, off you go, you're going to have to do it yourself. The support mechanism isn't fully there. Other reason I do it, and, and this again ties into the purpose of higher education. Higher education is about producing independent learners, people who can stand on their own two feet, that have given something, will be able to think about it independently, they'll be able to think about it themselves and have a position on it. And if it requires them to learn something new, they'll have the skills that enable them to pick up that new activity. So this is all part of the transformation that a higher education is trying to bring about. When you get into third, into fourth year, if you're on the MAs, you'll notice that third and fourth year modules don't have practicals. So first year does, but modules do have practicals because it's an introductory year. Second year, some do, some don't. Third and fourth year, don't really. So we're part of that particular journey that we're going through. Now, there's a balance in this. Uh, and like I said, I'm aware that every single year, I'm sure it'll be the same. You'll tell me at the end, it would have made things easier for you if there had been practicals. It would be nice if there were practicals. But I'm sticking to these two good reasons as to why we don't have practicals. By way of balance in this, when I'm actually assessing the project, I will take this into account. I know that you have been presented with a challenging situation. I know that you will largely then have picked up these different things under your own steam, so to speak. So when I'm assessing the project and having a look at what, been, uh, what has been created, I will be less demanding in my set of expectations. Alternatively, if I had a stuck on a series of practicals, I would have been more demanding because then I would have known, well, there was all these practicals to help do this, this and that. So I'd expect to have seen more. So overall, it'll balance out in terms of the marks that people get on the module. This will not have a negative consequence. But it does mean that during the module, you will have to put in that time and effort to, to learn and to master these activities. That's going to be, if you like, the cost, but it's a beneficial cost to yourself. A um, bit of a warning in this one here, and this is a rather dire slide in some sense. This is a 30 credit module, one and a half modules worth. It's an important module. If it's failed, you will not be able to progress. If it's failed at the first attempt and failed in the reset, you, you're on progression issues. You'd actually be kicked off the degree program. So this is a key module that must be passed. It really is important. Now, th this isn't a, 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 a glib truism. What, what is in this statement is true. Um, I have hundreds of data points from the students who have done it over the years. If you put in the time and effort, and you work reasonably consistent on the project, you will pass the module. That, that, that's more or less a given. Um, the people who have failed, the vast, vast majority of the people who have failed, are simply people who didn't put in the time and effort, who left it until it was too late to actually do anything on the project. And, and these are people who fail first time and then hopefully pick up in the summertime and, and pass it there, but then they're capped at 40% and it makes a mess of the summer as well for them. So you need to put in the time and effort by way of, of passing the, the module. I don't want anybody to fail. Uh, like I said, there's high risk in this here. If you do fail it, it, can have a progression, it will have progression implications. Again, if you're failing the reset, you can be off the degree. Um, and what we also, what I've, I've found is the students who do push it off, then in the second semester where they realize, oh, I better put a lot of time and effort in, they invest a lot of time and effort in the project. They may or may not pass, but this will have then an impact on their other modules because they're then um, not putting in as much time and effort as they should be across their, their, their complete set of modules. So as a consequence to this, and this is the, the, the dire warning in this slide, there's hand in points throughout the project. If it becomes clear to me that a student isn't engaging, isn't putting in the time and effort on the project that they need to put in, and they find themselves in a position where it's probably too late. Halfway through the module, nothing started. Look, at that point, I'm going to say to the student, I'm sorry, you failed then and there. There's no point trying to rectify it. It's too late. Um, I don't want them to mess up their other modules. 
they can be capped at 40% in this module. They can take the summer reset and hopefully pass it. If they don't, they're then off the degree. So I will fail people uh, midway through the module if it becomes clear that it's not that they're, they're on a trajectory which is going to lead to failure. There's no point stringing this out, no point damaging other modules as well. It's a rare to do this, and most people do put in the time and effort. But just to let you know that I, I will have to take this scenario if, if, if people don't. Uh, in terms of the project timeline, so this is how the project will break down. Semester one, we've got the 12 weeks here. The first two weeks is about getting people into teams. It's about getting, once the teams are set up, the ideas that people have to emerge in terms of what exactly you want to implement, what features you want to implement, that type of thing. Then the first sprint is from weeks three up to week five. And, and that's really about establishing a the framework, if you like, in terms of an Android game, the, the big things that, uh, uh, infrastructural bits that come together to make this possible. No functionality at this point, it, it's just simply, if you like, creating the framework, the plumbing, uh, which you can then build game features and game functionality into. There'll be a submission at the end of week three. Uh, this is the one that sets out the team that you're in, your goals, uh, the types of features that you plan to develop or you want to develop over the project. And you get a bit of feedback in terms of what it is you're planning, um, in terms of things that you look at particularly interesting, maybe high value or some suggestions on how you might do things. Weeks six, seven and eight is the second sprint. And during that sprint, there's going to be an opportunity to take the content that we're doing in lectures on how do you display graphics and get input or sound or things like that and start implementing some of these aspects. So there, you're taking your basic framework and you're adding in the ability maybe to display an image, to manipulate that image, to get some input, to do something as a consequence of that input. And there'll be a hand in at that point. And there we're interested just in making sure that all teams have been doing this, that they're, they're, they're seeing their functionality start to emerge within your, your game. Weeks nine up to the end of the module is the third sprint. Now, throughout this, whenever the teams are, are created uh, through the first and the second sprint, you'll be developing your ideas for the full game and, and it'll evolve and take shape over that period. So the third sprint, your, your goal here is to Take the basic input and output functionality, drawn graphics, playing sounds, detect the desired functionality you have within your game and start to piece these things together. So at the end of the first semester, you have something that it's not going to be a working game, but you've got the bits that are coming together to form the game in terms of the underlying core functionality that you will need. Going in then to the second semester, again, we've got 12 weeks here. Um, now, just to confirm, at the end of the first semester, you'll notice there's no hand in at this point. Instead, for sprint three, I'm going to let people sort of work over Christmas or into the January uh, if they want to. Um, so submission then will be, whenever you come back, start of the second semester, you hand me in an update at that point. And I'll give you some feedback in terms of how you've been doing. Sprint four then starts at the start of the second semester. And this is where your goal in that sprint is to develop the core functionality within the game. If you like, the core systems that your game will have that, that are unique to your game in terms of the gameplay elements of it. Uh, hand in point of this to get a bit of feedback on. Uh, sprint five from week four up to week seven. This is where you the game or the goal, I suppose, is to create a crudely playable version of it. So something you can play and going to be polished, isn't going to be complete. But nonetheless, you can sort of see the game there in a, in a crude form. You can view it kind of like an alpha version of the game. And again, there's an opportunity to submit and get some feedback. Uh, the sixth sprint then, from week eight up until week 10, that is where you take your alpha version and you add in the polish, you add in any extra additional functionality depending on the time that you have. And you produce something that is more or less your, your complete game or what you can accomplish after those six sprints. Week 11 then is really getting everything ready for submission, doing any minor uh, tidying up within the, the code or any minor refactoring elements you have of it. At uh, during week 11, you will be submitting in the project and that will be the complete code base you've developed along with some documentation uh, describing different elements of it. 
Uh, when that's submitted in, then we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. It'll be assessed, there'll be some vibes, there'll be some demonstrations and other related things. In terms of the actual project assessment itself, well, for this here, you get a mark out of 100. Uh, and it's broken down against the areas you can see on screen. So uh, professionalism, the quality of the architectural design, software design, how you've used uh, a different types of input or graphics or sound, the number of game features that you have, the extent of them, the complexity of the, the algorithms or the techniques that you're using within it, and the coding style and the code quality of whatever has been produced. So that's th these are the areas that will determine the mark that is, is given. Now, for this, you've got some control. So for example, professionalism, is always worth 10 marks. Uh, the architectural design always worth 15 marks. The coding style, code quality, always worth 25 marks. That gives you 50 out of your 100 marks. In the other categories, depending upon what you implement or where you want to put your time and effort, um, you can choose how many marks goes into those. So let's say, for sake of argument, um, you're picking game features, remember that you find fun, that you want to do. You think, well, I want to do a game where I'm going to bring to life a character and, and give it behaviours that does certain things. And there may be some nice algorithms underpinning that. So that's the type of thing the team decides, we want to do that, that'll be interesting. And you put your time and effort into doing that. Then you can put more marks, for example, in the complexity of algorithm section, um, because that's where you invested your time and effort. Equally, if you're doing a game, where you put in features here and features there and the loading screen and this type of thing and that. So you have lots of different features that people have added in to it. You can bump up the number of marks in the extent of game features category. Um, so again, if you only had a couple of features, you could minimize the number of marks in that. So it gives you some control over how the project is marked. And I'll talk about this through the module and much more towards the end in terms of optimizing elements of it. Code reuse section here, um, there's a lot of existing code out there. And in a lot of instances, it doesn't make sense to, to reinvent the wheel where you can find good illustrations or good algorithms that, that meet the, the, the purpose of it. So you're free to make use of existing algorithms, code fragments, classes, libraries, whatever you want to do. Um, we have to still untangle this. So in terms of actual assessment of it, if you're using them, I can give you marks for how you have used them or how you have adapted them or how you've integrated them. All of the projects will be set up to use code versioning. So we will have a clear record of who developed what and who committed what at what point in time. Uh, and that's going to be a key aspect of actually tracking uh, individual contribution to the project. Anything you submit in at the end will be subjected to an online plagiarism test. So if you are making use of third-party algorithms, you have to make sure they're suitably uh, referenced. And there's a section in the module handbook that tells you how to do that safely. At the very, very end, we'll have some vivas. So if I'm not certain about the authenticity of something, we'll have a viva, which is basically an oral examination, where you'll come in, we'll do code walkthroughs, I'll ask you some questions on it, and you can demonstrate to me that you did write it, that you have good understanding of that code fragment. So a little bit here just to, to, to highlight about the team-based nature of this and to encourage everybody to, to do their bit in terms of the team that you'll find yourselves in. Now, you do get an individual mark and the mark you get at the end will depend upon mostly what you have contributed in terms of your individual code. Now that doesn't mean that you can then like, simply ignore the other team members or you can be disruptive or things like this. So if I'm also seeing then, and this comes into the professionalism section, that the students are indicating that this is a person who helped the team. They were good at, at, at coordinating things. They were good at helping other members out. They were good at sort of general debugging and all of the useful things that help support a team. Then you can get marks for that as well. But fundamentally, I need to stress this here, is that you must develop your own code and be submitting your own code. Um, if we have a situation where we have somebody that was fantastic in terms of coordinating and managing the project, 
but he or she didn't implement any code, I'm afraid they'll fail the module on zero. So both of these are important, you must have your own code, it's in your own interest then to help the team by way of a good team experience, because that'll improve everybody within the team in terms of the artifact you have at the end, will help you in terms of the professionalism and the skills that you're developing through this. Now you can find lots more information there, there's two documents. Uh, one on the project assessment criteria, so I'll take each of these categories in terms of professionalism, architectural design, code quality, and tell you the types of things you would need to do to get a first, a 2-1, a 2-2, a third, or the types of things that would fail as well. So do go through that in terms of understanding how each category is marked. There's also project submission reports you can see in Queen's Online if you want to have a look at the types of uh, information material that you'll be submitting in that help me understand what each person has done or where you can ask questions and different things. Takeaways from this, I've got a couple of them here. Just to reiterate, project is at the heart of this module. It is by far the most important bit. Um, in terms of that project, aim to create a simple, fun, demo. If you go for a simple fun demo, you're pitching it right and it's the type of thing that's manageable uh, within the time frame that we have and the team sizes that we have too. Definitely do read the assessment criteria documentation because ultimately this is what your project will be assessed against and, and whilst you do have control in this process it's useful to understand how, what the different categories are and the types of things that will get you a first class mark in each of those categories because that's what you want to aim for then. So that's all we want to cover in this particular lecture. Next ones in the series we'll actually get into to looking at some introductory aspects on, on Android.